Hello to everyone. Welcome to a new episode of my podcast. I am Jimena, your host, and you're watching Live in the Sports Business with Jimena. Today, I'm thrilled to introduce my guest, Alex Vergara. He has a vast experience in the sports market. Alex is a lecturer at UCF, dictating sports events management, facility operations, and he is also the chief storyteller and founder of AV Consulting Group. Among the incredible companies that he had worked with, Alex worked as a tech director at ESPN Wide World of Sports and, and as a sports marketer at Walt Disney World. So hello, Alex. Congratulations on your amazing career and thank you for coming on. How are you? Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, from a very nice and warm place here in Orlando, Florida. Yeah. So wherever your listeners may be. Um, come on down to Florida, everyone else is. Yes, a nice place to be and warm. <laughs> okay, Alex, so to start, can you first tell us how did you get into the sports business? Like, how did you start your, par your path here in this market? Well, uh, I've always um, had a great um, interest and passion in, in the business of sports, Um And in college, I had an opportunity to work in the athletic department where I went to school at the University of Florida. And that's really where I caught the bug. I uh, worked in sports information, covering events, doing press releases and statistics and things of that nature. And it was such a great experience. Um, and I combined that with my broadcast degree and then, you know, graduated and took a job in a retail sporting goods company and continued to work as a statistician for uh, TBS, the Atlanta uh, network. And um, so I got to watch SEC football. I worked at a minor league basketball organization and I really missed the college space. So I went, came back to Miami to work at the U, the University of Miami. And, um, you know, each step of the way is a little different. People said, well, you graduated from Florida. How could you work at Miami? And I'd say, well, I'm a professional first and foremost. It's a great program, and I still have a lot of friends there and, and follow them very closely along with the Gators. Um, and then just had an opportunity to come to Disney. I was speaking at an event. I was a keynote speaker, and they were starting at that time the Wild World of Sports. It's a long time ago, probably 20, almost 25 years. And uh, they – They were there recruiting for people, and they said, hey, we're building this sports complex. Have you, have you even heard about it? I didn't even heard about it. And are you interested? And I said, sure. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm working for at the happiest place on earth, working for a six-foot mouse. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And you have an amazing career, as we've talked. So you started in the 80s in the sports market. Have you seen any change in, in oh. the industry? Yeah, the industry is definitely becoming much, has become, is, and will be continue to be very, very more sophisticated. There's a tremendous emphasis on a whole bunch of new spaces. Analytics didn't exist. Uh, branding was very rare. Everything was, was pretty mom and pop at that time. Uh, it's changed tremendously. Even the, the sports info is now considered uh, an old term. It's now considered a uh, uh, strategic communications for athletic departments. So the games on the field have changed, the viewership habits has changed, the consumer habits has changed, as well as the education of what people are getting. Uh, when I was in school, these degrees that are now numbered in over 200 didn't exist. There was one or two, Ohio U, for example, had one and, and a couple other places, but now there's you know tens of thousands of people wanting to get into this business because they enjoy it. Uh, they they have a passion for it and they think they can do a good job. But it's uh, it's it's a really seminal point now, though, with COVID and everything. And I think we're uh, the sports, like everything else, is reevaluating where it stands and what it's doing and how it's doing it in the future. Uh, so we're at we're all at a very critical uh, pivot point, as I like to say, for the for this industry yeah. uh, that's going to challenge a lot of its assumptions moving forward. And what has been your best lesson? during these years with the sports industry? Um, my best lessons is, um, gosh, that it's a business. You know, if you're just a fan, 
-hmm. oh, I like sports. I watch ESPN. That's okay. I still do that. But I, I'm really a fan of the business. Yeah. And uh, just like any other business, whether you were in sales or selling cars or um, an engineer, you've really got to understand what's happening in the industry so that you can continuously evolve and position yourself for the growth in that industry. Uh, as I mentioned, the Disney example, um, sports tourism was really beginning to grow um, in the early 90s. And that's where teams would come together with their families and they would travel to tournaments all over the country and compete against other teams. So that might have been the best players in, say, Ohio. and But they want to see how good they measure up against other teams uh, and so Disney became that destination, that ultimate destination for teams to come down. And we were doing, you know, um, well over a million visitors a year at peak and doing really well. And they could stay at the parks, um, buy their theme park tickets, eat their food. Everything was all, all self-contained. So everything is changing and continues to change. I think it's going to be pretty interesting how the fan experience changes now. And that's something I'm really watching and trying to keep up with the industry I don't think anybody really knows what it's going to look like yet. I don't think uh, the best of the best don't know. They're, they're, they have resources and they're moving ahead. But uh, I think a uh, year and a half from now, the fan experience in a stadium that might be two-thirds full or even full will be drastically different than it is today. Yeah. So I know that, that you have worked a lot with marketing innovation and revenue events, twist with ESPN, and so in these days, in, during this pandemic, what you have been talking I know that innovation and creativity are the key to this, but how do you, how, how do you um, direct this to, to be really effective? Like what you are saying, how, is, how are we going to do with the um, consumer experience to, to really be effective and to, and to bring a big impact to them? Well, it's a very good point. First, um, I would tell you that um, first you have to kind of listen really closely to, to your customer, your client, or your fan, and just listen. Uh, that's really the most important thing. And then once you listen, you, you kind of do some discovery. And I, I really don't think that uh, there's been enough listening maybe in the past they do surveys and we've done surveys and all those types of things but uh, and then and then have courage that you're making the right decision because you have a lot of resources around you to do it if you're if you're that lucky but innovation and creativity should really be one of the top skills that people are developing uh, for the 21st century career um, you have to be a lifelong learner. You have to learn a lot of things. Uh, when I teach, I teach classes that you mentioned at UCF and I'll bring out this big giant poster board with about 300 brands on it and I'll pass it around and I'll say, oh, can you tell me, and there was only one out of say 300, can you tell me which brand existed when I graduated school? And, um, uh, they all look around, they try to guess, and they're all wrong. Oh, uh, Netflix or Google or Apple is like, nope, 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 nope. And it just wound up just being one. And so well, that's the reality of what you need to know in the future. It's only going to get faster because there's all these new things happening all the time. Uh, now you've got the whole esports market growing. Uh, CrossFit has come and gone for athletic participation. Um, it's it's going to be just constant change and you have to be able to adapt yeah. um you know I, I always use a lot of sports analogies but if you're a great outside shooter um and you you know you hurt your shoulder and you can't shoot anymore you got to go in and rebound you got to change that up all the time and that's those are going to be the leaders in the marketplace that are doing creative things like this some past summer what the nba did with digital fan experience was very cutting edge and it's now leaked into the other sports. Um, and so there's going to be a lot of that. It's going to, and the television experience is going to change tremendously. Uh, I think the big thing is going to uh, – a three-hour game for most people is an eternity. And I think television programming is going to change quite a bit and be maybe smaller in content and 
that's why esports is really being watched by a lot of people right now yeah. because it's fast, it's quick. There's a lot of people doing it. It's a global sport. Um, and so what impact does that have? Uh, does esports come into the regular sports experience and become almost like an ancillary component of it? There's just a lot of different directions it could go. Yeah. It's just you got to be watching it, and then you got to have the, the toolkit to be able to uh, to support uh, any new ideas that come along. So what will be, like, the key to keep up with this fast industry? Keep adapting? Well, I... Uh, the Sports Business Journal is something I tell all my students to do. And it's interesting when I interview people, when I interview people for jobs at Disney, I'd, I'd ask them, well, how, how do you keep up with what's happening in the sports world? And I said, well, I, I watch SportsCenter or, or TNT or whatever. And I knew full well that they didn't really know what was going on. And the people who came in and said, well, I, I read this publication and this is, this is what I'm watching. Uh, these are the new leaders that are coming up that are now I'm aspiring to become. And how do I go about following them or getting to introduce to them? Because those are the people who are going to have the positions and the jobs in the future. So uh, definitely a big believer in uh, Sports Business Journal. But also, just as I said before, focus on creativity skills. Uh, creativity skills comes in a lot of different ways. Drawing, writing, reading. Uh, and, and looking at other industries that maybe have nothing to do with sports and how can you bring those things into the sports marketplace, whether it be guest service. Guest service is going to be really important because there's probably going to be an erosion of fans. And so you got you to deliver great guest service. Yeah. Like, and that was a big thing at Disney was all about the guest. You're always smiling, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah, that's very interesting. And... Well, I, I've been looking at, at, at your experience and in, when you were working at the University of Miami, I know that you worked on marketing campaigns designed to appeal to Hispanic market and then you developed dedicated Hispanic marketing programs for the university students. So yes. I was wondering how, how would you transfer these in sports companies who want to approach to the Hispanic market because you know that the Hispanic market is growing very fast and especially in Florida. Yep. Um, well, we, we were one of the few schools that, that uh, had a, a dedicated Hispanic marketing director that was part of my team. And um, what uh, my, that's why Miami is probably one of the most difficult markets in the, in the domestic market to, to be really successful at because it's so, so splintered. And, and, you know, people would think that if you translated the campaign that you were doing or did a poster with a Spanish headline, it was good enough. And it wasn't. No. Uh, we didn't, we weren't taking advantage of our, our student athletes who had, were from the area or could speak a second language and taking them out to the community enough. So that was first and foremost, go grassroots, but also understanding that the Hispanic Latino market is really a market within a market. There's, you know, everyone says translate it and it's good. No, in Miami, you've got uh, a mecla, as you know, a combination of a lot of different cultures and all those cultures listen to different things, consume different media. So we had to segment our media buys um, and stretch them out amongst multiple stations that had a specific Hispanic Latino market following and listener. And those were things that we implemented that seem obvious now, but at that point in time, being one of the few, the administration at the time was not doing that. We brought those kind of things in uh, to the program. And we were trying to build basketball uh, at the time. And we were doing really well in baseball. Miami baseball has a very solid program and they had a very strong following of Hispanic fans. And so we talked to them and go, hey, how can I get this 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 fan passion into basketball? And um, at the time they weren't they weren't supporting basketball, but we grew that fan base um, as we built the arena on, on campus years later. So it's just it's just being smart and listening to what's happening and, and looking at the information that you have and and not overgeneralizing because everything now is so so specific. And so, so content driven uh, that you've got to be spot on for it to be effective. And that, that was one of the techniques that we used. Do you think of, of a company that it's doing this really good? That it's targeting their Hispanic market really good? 
Oh, wow. Um, I think Coca-Cola has always been a very progressive uh, Hispanic marketer. Uh, I think Procter & Gamble's doing some great work with uh, all the consumer products uh, in the Hispanic market doing really well. I'm starting to see more and more uh, automobile dealers now coming up with uh, Hispanic uh, advertising. And um, it's interesting. I, I noticed this the other day watching. I was watching um, uh, in my AT&T TV okay. and they ran a commercial in English and they cut it to 15 seconds and then they did another 15 seconds and they did it in Spanish and it was the same commercial. Or instead of just running a 30 second spot on the break, they cut two 15 second spots of the same spot yeah. and one was in English and one was in Spanish. I thought, okay, that's, that's, those are little tweaks, but they start making sense over time. Yes. Um, and, you know, and it's not just Spanish, Hispanic, it's, it's, it's all diversity markets and, and being inclusive because a consumer, uh, if, if I don't look and sound like uh, the consumer that I need to reach, I may not be as effective and my brand might not be as effective as it should be. Uh, but this is growing, right? Because uh, do you remember the Super Bowl um, show? It was yes. with Shakira and Jennifer Lopez. With two yes, yes, yeah. I do remember the show. Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this was huge. And they were like really targeting the, the Latin people and the Hispanic yes. people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a growing market. Um, the African American market is growing as well, and each league approaches it a little differently, uh, and stays true to their core brand values. Uh, but then, you know, they want everybody in the stands. I mean, there's no there's when it comes to sports, uh, there's no discriminatory practices towards the fans. Fans are fans, mm -hmm. and so you want to come in. Uh, Major League Soccer has done a very good job, obviously. Uh, due to the passion for uh, soccer or football in the Hispanic market. And the MLS has done really well. We've got a franchise here in Orlando, Orlando City, that you're very familiar with that's yeah. done a fantastic job. They've got uh, uh, a very diverse front office. They're doing a lot of outreach. You go to the, you go to, uh, the games when the fans were there, and it felt very World Cup-ish, you know, with flags from different countries and – music and things like that and so they really capture an audience and even though it's mls and you might think it's a secondary or tertiary sports team they were out drawing many nights the orlando magic two to one yeah. and so they did a great job doing the outreach um and uh, so you know hats off to that organization i know you're associated with them and do some work with them but uh, you guys have done a great job with that yeah thank you so now um, talking about this virus that has affected everyone and all the industries, how I know that you have a consulting company. So how are you dealing with this pandemic? I know um, that you work with a lot of sports clients too. Um, what challenges are you facing right now? Well, I, I think the, the standard protocol that the states and the country and the domestic uh, leaders are putting in are consistent. And uh, what's not consistent is the operations. So for example, uh, one of the companies that I work with has established a, a check-in system for all of their food and beverage people and their merchandise people, because these are people that come in, they'll work a game or two and, they, and they're done. And so we ensure that we know who that person is, how they're, have they registered, have they been tested? Uh, and we, we check them in, we scan them, we test them. So the next time they come in, I already know that uh, Alex or Jamina has been tested and, and has no issues and she did a good job. And before it was just be, come on in, sign this piece of paper, here's your credential. Yeah. So things like that are beginning to develop to ensure that the people who are delivering the guest service are also in compliance with, uh, with things. Uh, you may see over time a change in construction of venues, how suites look. Um, you may see more common areas being built. Uh, so I think the days of uh, corporate suites of 20, 25 people mm -hmm. may change. 
quite a bit. And they may take the seats out someday and knock out a wall and make it uh, suites for 100 and put 30 people in there and, and split it up. So, um, like I said, everything is really changing day to day. Um, you look at the NBA as an example that started their season. If you look at their attendance, mm -hmm. they're all very, very different. Okay, so Orlando has determined – they're going to open their stadiums at 25% capacity. So 4,500, I think about. I don't know what they've done the first couple of games, but that was what was decided by the league earlier. And then there's other teams that are doing zero, no fans, and then everything in between. So uh, I think the key is to have a group of people who are sharing best practices and and that could be the industry, a publication that you read, a colleague that you that you have a contact with. And because uh, one thing this industry does really well is copy each other. And once somebody figures something out, everyone will be doing it over time. And I think the fans will be back. I think the fans will have a different expectation. I think the fans will be different. Um, and uh, I think 21 is still going to be a little bumpy until probably we get to the fall. And by the time we get to football season next year, mm -hmm. we'll have gone through the NBA and Major League Baseball. And then football, which is the biggest crowds, will then really start settling into what it's going to look like. Because this year's football season was very up and down with the cancellations and things. So yeah. it really is the wild, wild west right now. It really is. And I think there's a lot of experiences and fundamentals that come from pre-COVID that will exist forever. Good guest service, good follow up, uh, good pricing, good good value on your what you purchase as a fan, and uh, those things aren't going to go away. But now, when you come into the into the stadium with your family, my expectation is different. Like for example, we went. It wasn't a sporting event. We went to a fundraiser. My family and I went to give kids the world on Saturday. Okay. And it was all the lit, lit up how homes and everything like that. It was a beautiful, so 75 acres of lit up how homes and things like that. And it's a, they were able to raise over a million dollars. And now they're going to reopen the Give Kids World, which is fantastic. But that experience was very different. They made it a point to, to really, the first, when you get there, the first experience that you have is the, <clears throat> is the check-in experience, is the, the safety protocol. And they knew it and they did it well. And it was very organized. So you get a sense of comfort when you walk in, right? Oh, wow, they did this right. Or they didn't let anybody sneak through. All those types of things will influence the consumer. Because yeah. if I'm standing there, I'm bringing my family in, and I see somebody walk right through or sneak in and not go through the protocol or come in without a mask, you know what? I'm going to go, hey, that's not, that's not safety. So the fans will tell the owners that they're not doing it correctly. And so the owners don't want to hear that or the teams don't want to hear that. So they, they're, they're getting it right. And so everybody's being handled the same way and social distancing is in place. Even, even where people are eating food in the stands, the minute you pull that mask down to grab something to eat and you talk a little bit and have a drink and you get comfortable with that, They've got people that are walking around. In the old days, that was guest services, people making sure they were delivering great service. Yes. Now it's around the protocol. Hey, put your mask up over your nose. So I think those things are going to continue for the foreseeable future. I don't see that changing. Teams will get better at it and uh, make it so it's not so intrusive to the fan experience. Right now it's like, hey, get your mask on. Yeah. It'll, it'll feel a little softer. And people's... Uh, expectations will uh, will change with it and behaviors will change. Yeah. But uh, it's, it's going to be an interesting, uh, if people if people knew the answer, they could fast forward, say, two years and see what this is going to look like. It's going to be pretty interesting. Television is going to change as well, streaming and yeah. highlight packages and all that kind of thing. So we're, we're in, this is a, a lot of people get discouraged because there has been a lot of layoffs in the sports world and a lot of people are graduating or long time people are being let go. So there's a lot of talent out in the space right now that are looking for roles. And there's a lot of young talent getting started. And I would tell you that both sides of those of that um, trend are discouraged because there's no jobs being hired. But that doesn't mean you stop networking. That doesn't mean you stop doing things like this. 
uh, continuing to grow your network, those things are vital. That will never change. The, the, the network that you have and that you're building, uh, whether it be at your work or whether it be at a convention you go to or whether it be on a, on a board, all those things are key and will not change. It's not like all of a sudden you're going to be able to go reach the top of the space with nobody knowing who you are. That's not going to happen. That's true. Talking about this networking and and having your your relationships on. So, what, do you know what is the key to build these great partnerships when when you have worked at ESPN or even in University of Miami as director of marketing? What is the key to to build this great partnership with your as sponsors? Well, I think first and foremost to build the relationships, you have to always be selling, selling yourself selling the property that you're selling, selling the features and benefits of your product, always be selling. A lot of people say that, well, I'm not good in sales. I want to just go in the back room and do analytics. No, you're selling yourself. You're selling your ideas. You're selling the numbers that you think are right to your leaders. So um, Daniel Pink, who's one of my favorite writers, wrote a book about a year ago, and the title was To Sell is Human. So think about that for a second. The cell is human. Well, if you're a human, guess what? We all are, right? <laughs> Most of us. <laughs> you got to be able to sell, whether it's selling yourself to get into college, whether it's selling yourself to get into grad school, whether it's selling yourself to get that first job as a barista, or to, to sell yourself to become the vice president of marketing for the uh, Orlando City. Mm -hmm. You got to always be selling. So that's first thing. And then when you sell, really manage the relationship. Uh, and exceed the expectations. Call them up when you don't, um, they might not, you might not even need anything from them or you might read an article that really uh, resonates for you and you think of that person, hey, I was reading this and I remember the last time I got with you, we were talking about what you were doing with the fan experience and this article had three or four things. I thought it might be interesting if you got it. So it's not costing me any money. It's not costing the company any money, but it keeps those lines of communication open and that enables the relationship to develop. And you'll be surprised. And I'd be saying the same thing. Hey, network, network, what skills are you developing that no matter what team or what uh, function or what industry you go to, those skills are going to be continuously developed. Creativity, flexibility, the uh, ability to have relationships with people, being part of a team, uh, resilient being able to handle a no, have a tough skin. Those are things that you, uh, if you have possess those things, mm -hmm. you're going to be successful no matter what you do. That's right. And then if you can make- right Now, how is the event programming going on? I know that you know a lot about this because you have a lot of experience in this. And is it profitable? Like for example, for Orlando City to have 25% of capacity or- other other games that have also little capacity is it is it worth it um well first off you have to see where your revenue hierarchy is obviously in the pro space television drives everything yes right so the television they have to do those games in order to not have to pay back the money that the, that the league got right, which gets split up amongst the team. And the MLS division may be a little different, but that's how it all works. So people go, well, why are, we, why are you showing a game that, uh, that has 1,000 people in the stands? Well, it's obvious it's, it's safety protocol. But two, that game might be worth several million dollars to me. Look at the bowl games of football. They're, they're going to they're gonna bring these, these teams in. And there's not going to be any fans there. They're not going to have any ticket revenue, which sustains that organization for an entire year. Uh, but they need the television money. So if television drives it, television will become, it, sports will become more and more a made-for-TV event, per se. And, and, and um, But the rest of the events, it's, um, you know, and even the, the catering and the tailgating has gone away. So, yeah, they're, everybody's losing money right now, some more than others, and um, just trying to keep the brand relevant. Right now, relevancy is so, so important. If you shut down 
uh, like some, there's been a lot of bowl games in football that have canceled bowl games either for protocol considerations or they were going to it just didn't work. They were going to lose their their shirts, and they're going to have a hard time launching again. So that'll lead to contraction and less and less. And the ones that have a good organization, they run a lean operations. They've got people that are delivering good guest service that are making people feel safe. Then those are the organizations that are going to continue. And it. starting something brand new from the start right now is probably a high risk. Yeah. But if you can find something that is prudent risk and makes sense and get some revenue, it, it might work. Look at the, the money that the NBA generated from all their virtual fan experiences, which yeah. you never would have thought would be that, that profitable. But it did very well and it helped close the gap for the league and the teams that had local – ads in the games that they were on for national television. So it's a long-winded answer, but you just have to adapt and evolve. Otherwise, if you stand still, you're going to run over or shut down. Yeah, I know. Uh, that's the reality of what's happening right now. That's right. But there's, there's a bright future ahead. I mean, there's no doubt if you're creative and you have good ideas and, and, and things of that nature, you, you're going to be successful no matter what you do. Because uh, more so than anything else, people want vibrant, talented uh, people who, who are sports business professionals first and foremost mm -hmm. and, and that understand guest service and they, they can sell. All the other things will, will always be changing all around us. Yeah. And as you have said, always creativity and innovation. It shows in every good example that we are talking about, right? Absolutely, absolutely. So here comes the last question. Okay. Um, do you think we need to do a change in the sports business forever? Uh, no, I don't think the fans will want something to change forever. <laughs> I think they may they may think they want to change and you make the change and, and you'll see if more fans adopt it. But if a small percentage of fans want something and you do it and the rest of the fan base doesn't adopt it, it's probably not going to sustain itself. You're going to move on to something else. Um, I do think sports is being challenged quite a bit uh, in terms of got to stay younger because – uh, I'll give you an example. On college campuses, fundraising is very important for development, right? Mm -hmm. And the people who are giving money now to buy buildings and and underwrite professors and things like that are getting older. Yeah. So they want to keep their money now so they can retire and, and move on. So now there's this big gap between the big money people that are older that have been giving money for, for decades to now the next rung of folks that are coming up Mm -hmm. and maybe did not have as much of an association with the university. Um, and so now they're, they're trying to get them up to these levels, but they don't have a relationship with them. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, it's just staying relevant and adapting and changing. And I think one of the key, that's probably why eSports uh, e has grown so big on, with many teams, is they think that's a way to get the fan interested in my sport and then bring them over to come to the games. Uh, so you're seeing more and more esports venues being built in suites um, and in-game experiences, things of that nature. So keeping them keeping them younger so that they can become fans for life, and you can increase the value of the fan in your in your business forever, uh, or as long as they're around. That's really really important. It can't be a one and done. Otherwise, you're not going to sustain yourself. Yeah, that's true. And right now, a lot of, um, like, for example, so professional soccer teams are sponsoring these gamers so so they can bring their fans to the team, too. So yeah. It's, yeah. it's a crazy and amazing business, <laughs> how, how everything links, right? It does. It does. It's, uh, I mean, it's changed a lot. There's things that uh, weren't being done. There's things that were being done that have stopped. Um, and it's just like everything else, you know. Uh, new stuff comes along and it captures the attention and the interest of the fan and the fan flocks to it. Yeah. It's just, that's just the way it is. Um, and you can't stand still. You can't stand still, especially now. That's true. Uh, so 21 is really about 
being prepared for the rebound. I was just reading something about some, uh, um, you know, how right now they call 2020 the year that never was. <laughs> and uh, 2021 is going to be the best year yet. And if you think of that, the best year yet, it doesn't say the best year ever. Yeah. It doesn't say the best year of all time. It's just the best year yet, and we better be ready for the yet. For yes. Sure. <laughs> so, um, Alex, we are going to do this new section. It's a ping pong section. So, ping pong, okay. Yes. So, I'm going to tell you some words, and just tell me whatever comes to your mind, okay? Okay, yeah. Ping pong word. Okay, so storytelling. Entertaining. Sports business. Dynamic. Sporting events during COVID. Flexible. Best sports business example. The NBA. And future of sports. Who knows? <laughs> Oh, that's right. Well, Alex, thank you so much for this opportunity of interviewing you today. I hope yeah, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, You've got a nice little show going. Yeah, thank you, and I hope you, I hope the best for you and and everything that comes. Okay, so this is all for today. Thank you for being here and watching us and listening to us. Um, I'm Jimena. Go team. All right.